Welcome back to another Canadian Immigration Live q and I'm your host, Mark Holthy, with a little bit of a different background. I decided to go with the green screen this morning. The uh, typical backdrop that I have, um, well, my camera stopped working, so I had to get a new camera, and I didn't have a time to get it set up. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put up the old green screen, uh, a little bit of nostalgia <clears throat> for the early days of these live Q&As. And this is a, a picture behind me here. <laughs> of the road leading up to my absolute favorite place, fishing um, in the Upper Old Man River here in the Rocky Mountains of Alberta. Well, I want to start off by just uh, pulling up this comment right here from Alexa. Wow, this is what an awesome way to start a live Q&A. Alexa says, Hi Mark, finally got my AOR for TR to PR two weeks ago. It was a long wait from May from May 6th, but I never complained. So this is November the 17th, you guys. So if you have not yet received your acknowledgements of receipt, don't stress, don't worry. It's totally fine. Everybody's in the same queue. And um, Alexa comments that being able to apply is already a blessing. Hopefully good news soon. And I absolutely agree with that. I think this is what a lot of you are gonna see. So let's give Alexa a little bit of a shout out here. All right, so as always, as you connect in, make sure that you post where you're tuning in from. We love to see where you're listening from and where you are, um, you know, how late you're actually up trying to watch this live Q&A. So hello, uh, Jagdish, good to see you. Um, we've got Marcus from Turkey, AOR December 2019. Yes, a seasoned federal skilled worker outland. Absolutely. You guys have been hanging on for so long and really, Marcus, um, I have to assume with the way they've turned off the, the issuance of ITAs uh, for the, you know, no program specified in the CEC draws, that it's going to result in you, and I'm going to turn up my mic here because I know it's a little bit quieter. Um, just give me a second here, then you guys can hear me. Okay, I think that's a little bit better there. Um, basically, I know that you guys have been the stalwarts who've been hanging around a long time. And uh, I know there's a lot of you, but I have to assume with the changes that the government has made in terms of focusing on all of the pending applications that you guys are going to see positive news. So hang in there. All right, let's see who else we have. We've got uh, Sabia who is, oh, Matt. Okay, yep, from Saskatoon. Got a little typo there. Maybe I should change my name to Matt. Matt, that's kind of a, an international name. You bet. Okay. Um, we've got Dan over in Halifax. Welcome, Dan. I uh, I am doing fantastic. And uh, I also want to let you guys know that today I am not alone. And I have a wonderful, wonderful uh, announcement to make, something I've talked about a lot over the last few months. I have been actively searching for another lawyer that's just the right fit to join Healthy Immigration Law, someone who gets it, the way that we do as lawyers who um, who understands the immigration process and someone who cares about what we do as much as we do and, as, of course, as much as you guys do. So without further ado, we've had a little bit of technical difficulty here. Um, I'm not sure if it's on my end or if it's on Chanel's end, but we're going to pull Chanel in here. How are you, Chanel? Hi, Mark. I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So Chanel is the newest member of our firm. Chanel is a, an immigrant. She's an immigration lawyer that joined our firm just two days ago. And I said, I have got to get Chanel in here. I absolutely have to. So, uh, so I'm so happy to have you. Welcome, Chanel. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to meet everyone and introduce myself and hopefully start um, getting to work. Absolutely. So Chanel, tell us a little bit about your background. Obviously, your uh, your accent is not uh, the the Canadian version. It's something different. Tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your story. So my accent is a little confusing because I've actually lived in a few different places. I am originally from Australia, but I have spent time living in Europe and the UK. Um, and I moved back to Australia about seven or eight years ago. Um, but I just didn't find that it was home anymore. So at the time I was really thinking where, where would be a good place to go? And I had come on holiday to Canada. I had such a great feeling about Canada when I came here. It just felt like it was the right place for me. 
Um, so after a couple of years of being back in Australia, I um, decided to start the process and I managed my own express entry process and successfully immigrated here. So I landed in Canada in 2018 and have been here for just over three years. I'm now ready to start the process to hopefully become a citizen, which is really exciting because this is home now. I feel so at home. This is, I'm in Toronto, which is a great city. And this is definitely, I think the best place I've ever lived. Wonderful. So I'm that excited is... because mm -hmm. I'm able to hopefully start working with everyone that relates to the process, having been through it myself, in addition to bringing my legal background. Um, so yeah, I'm ready to get started. That is awesome. Yeah. We're so happy to have you as a member of the team. And um, I think that's the thing that, that is really nice uh, is, is the fact you've gone through, you've had an opportunity to, to live it, live the experience, right? And uh, then when you add on the fact that now you are a Canadian called lawyer in, uh, for, with the Law Society of Ontario, um, it's just a perfect fit. Now, tell us a little bit about that journey, because I think some people think, oh, she's coming from a Commonwealth country. You know, they probably just accept her law degree and she can just practice. But me coming from India or coming from the Ukraine, which is Igor with our firm, they, they're making me go through all these hoops and pay all this money just to practice in a profession that, that I already, you know, I've already completed the credentials. So yeah, so tell, us, tell, tell our listeners a little bit about that. We all have to jump through the hoops, regardless of whether you're coming from common law or civil law backgrounds. It's the same process for everyone. Um, common law is a little bit easier just in the sense that the, the legal system is, is more similar. So you don't have maybe as many requirements to tick, but it's the same process where before you can sit the bar exam or do articles and actually be called to the bar, you have to sit exams through the NCA, the National Committee of Accreditation, and actually to, to convert your overseas education into a Canadian law degree. So this just ticks off the boxes of the Canadian legal knowledge that you wouldn't have had having completed your degree overseas. Um, instead of doing the NCA exams, I actually did a master's at the University of Toronto, which was a great program, um, and they were fully accredited to meet the NCA requirements. So for me, I felt that was a better way to go about it because I could be in class, learning, making contacts, um, really just you know learning as much as I could about Canadian law. Whereas with the exams, it's very much just self-study. You sit the exam, you tick it off. Um, so it was about a year process of doing the masters. And then once I completed that, I, similar to all Canadian lawyers, I had to go through the process of doing my articles and which I did with a Toronto based commercial litigation firm and then sitting the bar exam, which is not an easy thing to do, but I am glad to say that I completed all that earlier this year and um, am fully admitted now as a lawyer in Canada. Wonderful. That's awesome. Well, for those of you who tuned in, we're going to have um, uh, Chanel share some of her top tips and, and problem areas that she experienced in just a bit. But let's give a few more shout outs to people that are tuning in. Um, LJD, this is this is Lou Danson, who is our um, resident immigration lawyer. Out, I think Lou's, you're in Ottawa, I think he is. He's saying hello. And uh, Lou has also started down the path of... Uh, you know, offering master classes and things like that. So I'm pretty sure that's who LJD is. Uh, so we'll give a shout out to, to, to him and for us trailblazers who are practicing law in new and creative ways. And so big shout out to him. Let's see who else we have here. We've got Amit, who's in Virginia down in the States. Good to see you as always. And Ralph Hansky, good to see you, Ralph. And those of you who uh, probably have heard me talk about Ralph and Bella and, and Kai, um, they are just like family who were previous clients that are all now permanent residents. And our Ralph's a very faithful follower. He always jumps on and says hello. So big shout out to you, Ralph. And my little godson, Jaden, who's up on your shoulders there in your, uh, your, your little thumbnail image. Okay, um, if you have questions, remember, hold off on asking those questions till I give you the green light. Then we'll dive in and we'll take really the whole rest of this time um, answering questions. Um, Chanel has a few things that she's got to get to. So once we do a few more of these, after she shares a little bit of insight on her express entry process, the pros and cons, things to, to do, things to not do, then we'll let her drop off and then I'll continue forward with the Q&A. 
But uh, yeah, we're all really, really excited. She's not quite up on the website yet because we've had some technical difficulties with our website. She was up yesterday, but she's not right now. So Igor is working on that while he is also going to school at the University of Calgary's Faculty of Law, taking care of his requirements so that he can join us and Chanel here in the firm as our, what is it, fifth lawyer, I guess. So that's the plan. Okay, let's see who else we've got here. So Divine says, good evening. Now, I'm not sure where Divine is, but I'm assuming it's pretty late where they're tuning in. Good to see you. Uh, we've got Myrna, who's over in Victoria, BC. It's probably rainy Victoria, right, Myrna? Uh, we've got Singh, who's saying hello here. Let's see who else we've got. Um, <laughs> Ralph says, Canadian Immigration Institute fan. You bet. You're a Canadian Immigration Institute alumnist. That's what you are, Ralph. Okay, we've got Moses tuning in from Nigeria. Moses is watching over on the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. So those of you who are focused on Express Entry, head on over there, request to join, and you will find Chanel very active over there. So one of the things that Chanel's going to take on is, is kind of administering and managing the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. So make sure that um, you just search for that, Express Entry Law, and uh, in Facebook, and you'll be able to request to join. Make sure you answer the questions. Every single person that's in there has to answer the questions. So we know there's not a bunch of bots and spammers and scammers getting in there. Okay, we've got uh, uh, Jama is over in South Africa. We've got Ajay is in Nanaimo. I'll be honest, you guys, this is my favorite part of this, is just giving shout outs to people. Uh, Thesura, hello from Sri Lanka. Long time follower, long time, right, Thesura? Also, he is an alumnus of the Canadian Immigration Institute's Express Entry course. And uh, those of you who are, let me just flip over here. I think I can pull, pull this up and I'll just show you guys. Uh, let me just flip this screen around here and see if I can get this sorted out. Let's see if we can find it. Oh, that's not too bad. It's, I think it's covering most of the page here. So all you have to do is click on the link below. And if you click on see our courses, I have to update this. Oh, it is updated. Good. You can see the next one is launching December the 6th. Now, a lot of you are saying, hey, there haven't been any draws. There's not, not much need to do this. Well, the reality is if you take the course and you go through it now, you're going to have an opportunity to learn everything that you need to know so that you're prepared well in advance. And there may be even a few things, mistakes that you've made in your profile that you didn't realize that after you get the invitation to apply, it becomes very difficult to correct. So go in here, check this out. This is where you can register for it. And you can actually scroll down to the bottom and you'll see individuals. Let's see, I'm trying to see if we still have uh, the sir on here, right down here, there he is. So a past alumnus of the, uh, of the express entry course, the step-by-step -step course. And starting December the 6th to the 10th, there will be a master class for one hour every day in the evening that week uh, where you'll jump on with me and have the opportunity to uh, to basically uh, uh, get your questions answered in a very, very small group. Because let's face it, and Chanel, she understands this as well. There's no way we can answer everybody's questions within the Q&A today, but uh, we'll definitely try to get to the ones um, that uh, that are going to be the most help to the individuals that are following. So hello, Thesura, good to see you. Uh, we've got um, Hassan, who's over in Kenya. We've got the African, good African representation today. Uh, Maimo, hello to, it's hello to you as well. And, um, and then Mash says, very nice, Canadian Immigration Institute, thank you. And you can see Mash is over on the Canadian Immigration Institute's uh, Facebook page. So there's three different locations. I think even Twitter, you can probably watch it now. I think we've got that set up again. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Junior says, an anxious hello from Brazil. Well, I'm not sure what the ang anxiety is about, um, Junior. More than likely, you've probably got an application pending and you're just hoping that they're going to get to processing. So big shout out to you. We've got Mark who's over in Toronto, over where Chanel is. So good to have you. Um, it's great to have you, Mark. Uh, oh, actually, do you know what? He's saying, hi, Mark <laughs> from Toronto. So it's Suvia. That's who it is. That's awesome. I love this. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. I'm going to pull up a few more and then we'll shift over to uh, some express entry tips from Chanel. Um, Irfan is over in Pakistan. Good to see you. Um, and then we've got a bunch of people posting questions. Hold off on your questions. I'm going to scroll down through. Uh, let's see. We've got Joel who's over in the Philippines. Hello. Uh, Sohan De Silva. 
that sounds like a Portuguese name. Let's see who else we've got here. Uh, we've got Rima, who's over in India. Uh, Simi is in Bahrain. Um, Elikim is in PEI. This is awesome. And we've got, there we go, Maimo's in Calgary. So in the house. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and look at who's here. Look at who's tuning in. It's Igor. So awesome, Igor. <laughs> I think we've been talking about the website. Not it, it flipped back now, so Chanel's no longer on there. And I know you're working on it, my friend. Igor is so dedicated. He's going to school and he's filling in part-time here for us while he completes his credentials. So we really appreciate all that Igor does. And we've had Igor on and you guys know him very well, um, but we're excited for the day that he can get his call. So Igor will complete his education. Then he'll start his articles um, with our firm. And then hopefully before too, too long, he can call himself a, yet another member of our Canadian immigration law firm. Okay, let's see what else we have here. We've got Alicia, who's in on, uh, who's in Ontario. Uh, Elias is over in Santo Domingo. Very cool, Dominican Republic. Um, Elias, I actually have a client that we're doing a spousal sponsorship, and and uh, she is in uh, the Dominican Republic right now, hoping that this spousal sponsorship will go through fairly quickly. Her husband's here in Alberta, so um, yeah, we just had our final review of their application yesterday. So it's nice to see other people from there. We've got India, we've got South Africa, Elaine. Um, Rashid's over in Qatar. This is really fun. Raj is over in Toronto as well, so over in Chanel's neck of the woods. Uh, and Karen, waiting patiently since March 2020. Yes, we know how many of you are in that queue. I, I truly, truly think that the wait is not gonna be too much longer for you guys. Make sure you watch your emails because you're going to get notifications that they're ready to move forward. Uh, Qatar, uh, Mujib, and George. Hey, we've got George Cosma as well. And George is another alumnus. I can't remember, George, if we have you also on here, but let's, let's see if we still have George here. I can't remember. Oh, there's George right over here. So right, you can see right here, that's George. So big shout out to you, my friend. Good to have you tuning in. It's great when uh, the graduates of the Canadian Immigration Institute Join us. So cool. Uh, let's see. Tanzim is from Bangladesh. Hey, thanks for joining us. You know, we've talked a lot about this, the the reason that we do the live Q&As. And in our meeting with our firm yesterday, we have a, a weekly um, strategy meeting, we call it, just talking about how we can do things better within the firm, how we can serve our clients better, and just overall, the things that we spend our time doing that help the firm to grow. And this live Q&A, as many of you know, I've probably been doing it since maybe 2017. Um, it started in the Express Entry Law uh, private Facebook group, and then it gradually shifted over so that now it's broadcasting through a number of uh, a different avenues. But this, this uh, live Q&A is really for us to, in a way, it's kind of like social proofing. It's a way for us to show you who we really are. And you guys have seen, you know, the way that I approach things, but to get to know us a little bit. There's so many websites out there that are nameless and faceless and sure they're slick and they're fancy, but you have no clue who's actually working with you. But within the firm here, we have our, all of our lawyers working directly with you. And that's one of the things within our collaborative review that we value more than anything. So it's, it's great that uh, people like you, Tanzim, that are, that are dedicated and follow, but this is our opportunity to just give back to help. You know, some firms offer free consultations. Well, in a way, this is kind of like our free consultation. When we have uh, people wanting to book consults, we charge for that. But that's largely because of the fact that when you pay, you actually get help and assistance. And, um, and that's why we've set it up the way we do. Okay, we'll do a few more shout outs and then we will shut down here. Okay, Saeed says, hey, Mark and Chanel, thanks for your great job. I'm Saeed from Toronto. Excellent. And then we've got Arshana who's over in South Africa as well. And let's see what else we have here. Ascola is over in Tanzania. I don't know if we've had anyone from Tanzania for a while. We've got Mumbai and um, Manish says, finally received the passport request for Outland CC applicant. Okay, I've got to give him a, a, a hand. Now you have to post in here, Manish, when your AOR was so people can get a feel for how long it's been in the queue. All right, Abu, good to see you. Thank you for, for connecting. Another Facebook user who's over in the uh, Express Entry Law private Facebook group. And uh, so from the Philippines. 
And let's see, we've got uh, Dora was over in Lebanon. Abu is in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Yes, indeed. Uh, and then Eric's from the Philippines working in SA. So lots of people, lots of people from the Philippines and all over in Saudi Arabia and in the UAE. Um, oh, here we go. It's Simone from Halifax just popping in to say hi. Hello, Simone. It's great to have you. All right. And we've got Nitin is over in Kitchener and uh, Lachan is in Punjab. And um, Shaun sends love from India. Great. Right back at you. Rajul's in India. Blake's in Vancouver. And I'm scrolling through here to try to give everybody a shout out today. Uh, Samay's in India. And Vanitha is also in India. And let's see here. Uh, Nuzrul is over in Bangladesh. And I think we've just about got there. Let's see here. Greetings. Oh, Isaac's in Mexico. And remember, there we go. So those of you, <laughs> we've successfully made it through giving shout outs to everybody. Um, so what I wanted to do at this stage is just turn a little bit of time over to Chanel just to share some of the, the things that she experienced going through the process and provide some tips for you guys uh, on, on areas that might be a little bit of a sticking point for you uh, or things that you might not be aware of. Um, so Chanel, why don't you fire away? Sure. So my first tip would be actually just coming back to the Facebook group. This is where I started my process. I found the Express Entry Law Facebook group and I joined it and it had so many valuable resources and watching you, Mark, do the lives back in 2017. I remember those. Um, them along with the just the community of people in the Facebook group, the comments, the ability to ask questions, to go through and read others' questions and answers provided so much knowledge. So as the starting point, I would advise everybody joins the group um, just because there's so many resources available in there for free. So once I had done that, I started navigating the process myself and overall was lucky enough to have a relatively smooth process. Um, but I did encounter a couple of hiccups along the way. So the first, I guess, issue I had um, was when it came to getting my proof of funds ready. So I knew in advance that I needed to have a certain amount of money in my account. Um, you need to show the six month average. So I had that money in my account long before I was, you know, I, I received my, uh, my request. So I, that was fine, but actually proving that was a challenge because my bank in Australia um, told me that they don't write letters. It was against bank policy to provide a letter outlining everything that I needed. Um, so to get around that, I, I pushed. So I was first talking to a bank teller. I asked to speak to the manager. Uh, the manager was very sympathetic to my situation, very friendly and willing to help, but unwilling to budge from their policy. So to work around this, um, we there's there's a checklist of of things that the letter needs to outline, and I wanted to make sure everything was included. So firstly, when it came to the bank details, the contact details, uh, the bank manager was actually willing to send me an email just uh, confirming what we had discussed that they are unable to provide a letter and that. What, what, what we have provided instead. So that email had his address, footer, um, it included his email address, included a telephone number, all the details that were required um, to meet that requirement. In addition to that, I was able to print off in the bank a number of documents um, that demonstrated everything that was needed to show my, my credit, um, to show any debts that I had. Um, and also I included bank statements um, purely for the reason that my bank statements were the only documents that I could get that showed the date my accounts were open, which is another requirement. In compiling all of this, I then also wrote um, an, a letter of explanation explaining why I had included so many documents and what each document's purpose was um, to make it very clear that, for example, the bank statements were there to demonstrate um, the, the date that the accounts were open. And on top of that, the bank manager was able to stamp each page of the document with the day's date to show that I had actually gone into the bank, gotten these documents from the bank at that time and date. So it just helped to authenticate that huge document I ended up submitting instead of the bank letter. Um, and that ended up being accepted. There were no issues with that. So the key is don't take no for an <laughs> answer. 
push further to see what else you can get, but also just set it out so it's very clear. Like it, I think my document was about 35 pages in length by the end of it, which is a lot for the officer to go through. So just making that letter of explanation very clear um, and obvious what you've included so that it minimizes how much work they have to do to find the information um, that they need. I think on my uh, bank statements, I even went through and highlighted the date manually so that it was obvious that that was the key piece of information on there, um, just to make it as straightforward as possible. So that I, I, I think that from, from memory, that the knowledge to go and do that came partially from the resources that I, I accessed through the Express Entry Law Facebook group, just coming across what other people have done. Um, and I just, so, I, so I, I knew that that was really the best case scenario. That was the best I could do. And it worked. Yeah. My second, um, I'll, I guess I'll add one thing, Chanel, I'll bet you any money that if we took a poll here in our live session and asked how many people have banks that are refusing to give this, this perfected letter that somehow IRCC feels is going to be really easy for, uh, you know, for people to get this, <laughs> this official letter. Um, I bet you the vast majority of them would run into the same issue where they just couldn't get it. And so that type of insight is really the thing that is super, super valuable, especially I was talking with Chanel before we, we jumped on the live session and I said, look, one of the things that makes your experience so valuable is that you've been there, you've done it. And uh, it's anybody can go and read the website. Anybody can go and, and figure out, you know, generally what, what immigration wants. Now, a law degree helps to understand the law, to understand how to read the legislation, to understand that, the policy that immigration puts on the website is just their thoughts on what they think the law is. But ultimately, if we disagree, we can always go to a judge, to a justice in the federal court, to determine what the interpretation of the, the actual law is. Because sometimes the instructions even that immigration gives on the website are arguably not right. And they take the position that this is what we want. But as you guys have watched in probably some of the previous videos, Sometimes, like express entry, um, the officers have refused applications when they shouldn't have. And, a, you know, a, a, a lawyer that's retained to go and challenge it will go to federal court. And then the court will say, no, immigration, you shouldn't be treating an applicant's application like this. Or you should have accepted that document that they, they couldn't obtain. And this is a good example to Chanel with the, with the proof of funds letter, because um I always tell everyone, do exactly what immigration asks you to do. That's the first piece of advice we always give. But the reality is sometimes a third party that you're having to deal with refuses to give you exactly what you need. So then, just like you've explained, and this is what we always teach in, in I teach in the master classes, I teach in, you know, when people book consultations, if you can't get the exact thing that immigration wants you to have, then do your best to give them the information that they're looking for that's contained in that exact thing through whatever means you can. So that's a great one to, to identify. Okay, so that was number one. So what's number two, Chanel? Num number two wasn't as much of an issue. At least I didn't think it was at the time, but I fully believe this is what delayed the process for me. Um, so I used to live in Europe and we have open borders in Europe, which means you're traveling constantly between different countries and there's no record of it. You just drive across the border. So when it came to actually filling out my travel history, trying to put all that together took a long time, going back through my emails and credit card records to try and find when I had actually booked trips, but then also trying to remember every time I had crossed the border, was very challenging. So I, I managed to put that together, but it was extremely long as a travel history because it's something you do so frequently in Europe, you know, even just for the weekend, you might just drive over the border somewhere. Um, I put it together, it was very long, very complicated um, and submitted everything. And I didn't hear anything for three months, which this is back in 2017, 2018. So at the time, applications were actually being processed very quickly. And this was a long delay, especially coming from another Commonwealth country. Um, so eventually, after three months, I heard 
back from immigration and they requested that I fill out my travel history again. They provided a different form, I guess, that laid it out in a more clear manner. Um, and so I went through and made sure all the details were correct. It was as thorough as possible um, and resubmitted that. And they seemed to accept that, but it took another three months from that point until I received my passport request. So it's definitely delayed the process for me, but I think it's exceptionally important to include all that information. Don't skip anything, try and find it and disclose everything because you don't want to misrepresent yourself. Um, it's, you know, the, the outcome was positive in the end and the delay didn't cause me any issues. It's worth waiting a few extra months if needed to make sure that everything goes through. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind with travel, start to map it out as soon as you start your process start trying to map it out and have it there and keep a record of anything uh, anywhere you travel since then because it is quite a complicated thing to put together um, and just try and remember every time you've crossed a border even if there's no record of it in your passport yes i will flip back here to our youtube channel and i will remind everybody about this video right here so this misrepresentation video that alicia did and i um it was kind of our Halloween special. Um, it is so important that you guys go and you watch that video because one of the things we wanted to, to let everybody know is that every single thing that you put in that application is serious. And, you know, uh, Chanel sat in on a number of consults with me on Monday in the afternoon. And there were a number of people who were basically in a situation where they're either their representative told them, don't worry about disclosing that prior visa refusal. It doesn't matter. Or, or they themselves thought that, ah, oh, it's not really important. I can just generalize with my travel history or my address history. You know, that's where I was getting my mail. So it's probably okay just to leave it there, right? Well, all of that, even the smallest little um, misrepresentation and, and anything can be a misrep. It can be something that you've, you've by commission, you've actually stated something that's incorrect or by omission, failing to tell something that you should. And yes, misrepresentation needs to be material, but wow, the definition of what constitutes material is unbelievably broad. So that's what Alicia and I were talking about, and you definitely want to go and watch that video right here and uh, and connect in because this, this really, well, if you're not scared right now, it should scare you. We're not you know, as a firm, we don't go out of our way to fear monger. We don't go out of our way to scare people into being afraid, but you do need to take these things seriously. And one of the things we've also seen Chanel is when they come back and ask for you to complete new background declaration forms, sometimes you may have forgotten something that they know about. And we just did, um, I just did uh, prepared um, and helped a client to draft what I call my express entry um, uh, disclosure submission. In other words, it's after the file has been submitted and we've done it for TR to PR, especially because I know a lot of you were rushing through to get your TR to PR pathway applications filed and you missed things. You forgot to disclose things. And when it comes to the statutory information section, wow, that's one that can result in five-year bars for misrepresentation if you fail to disclose something such as a refusal that you should have. So um, yeah, yeah, just yesterday I helped to, to finalize um, uh, the final review of, uh, of a submission explaining basically, hey, I know I made a mistake, please accept this. And we've tried to do it proactively. And how we help our clients usually comes in three forms. The worst is when we're having to request reconsideration after an application has actually been refused or misrepresentation has been found and then together with that reconsideration request, we often have to consider a judicial review to try to stop that very, very punitive uh, misrep finding from, from being with this person for life. And remember, any misrep doesn't just affect your admissibility to Canada and a bar from Canada it can also affect your ability to go to the US or Australia or, the, or, or England, the UK or New Zealand, and, and all of those countries have information sharing. So any visa you apply for those countries, they're going to see what happened in Canada. So it's really, really serious, and it's important that you take that into consideration. 
So uh, we help with the reconsideration or the JR if an application has been refused. One that we get a lot of is when you receive a procedural fairness letter, which says, hey, you didn't disclose this and I think you may have misrepresented yourself and we may find, uh, uh, we may uh, issue a five-year bar to you and refuse your application. And so that's the second one when you get the PFL letter. And then the other one is, well, I guess there's almost four because then another one is when they come back and make the request like Chanel has talked about for further more detailed information. It's usually because they're fishing for something. They're looking for something and want to see if your first response is consistent with your second response. And for some clients, when they have not realized how serious that is, they will respond to the background declaration and commit the same misrepresentation because they don't realize and then the first one is, and I guess first or fourth, however you want to order them in, in the degree of, uh, of, of severity, is just someone recognizing themselves that they made a mistake and needing to fix it. So those are the, the things that we do all the time within our firm. And I'd say right now, because express entry is slow, because um, the, the, the government has really slowed down on issuing invitations to apply, um, we spend a lot of time doing that. So head over to the site. Pretty soon you'll see Chanel up there. She'll be up there. But right now, just click on book a consultation and then you'll be able to scroll down, pick the lawyer that you want to work with and you'll see Chanel. She'll be right up here as well. And uh, and th this is why we're here. We're here to help you guys. All right, there we go. Anything else? Any parting words, Chanel, before we, we let you slip away? I would just add to that the simple thing I probably could have done with my travel history to avoid being asked for more information maybe would have just been to submit a letter of explanation explaining my complicated travel history to make it clearer because it could just be that it looked very confusing it didn't make sense to the officer who was reviewing it um it's, there's just simple things like that the more information you can provide and the clearer you can make it i think makes the process a lot smoother so that's my i guess one little mistake that i would go back and have done differently gotcha that's a great tip because like I said, lots of people, you just don't know sometimes what you don't know. And when you're trying to fill something in and you realize, oh, okay, there's an issue here. I know I made a, I know that I can't quite answer this question fully because of some reason. Well, how do I deal with it? And one of the things that we spend a lot of time in the express entry course, and this is just the one from September, the last one that we did, um, the December one has a whole new, uh, a new set of modules for the people joining that. But one of the things we talk a lot about, and it's right in our Mastering the Document section, I'll just make sure that I've got this pulled up properly here. Um, in the Mastering the Document section, we have a lesson that is specifically geared to what you've just described, and I call the secret sauce, which is basically the letters of explanation, which includes templates that are specifically designed to help you draft that letter of explanation for documents, and for the information sections in the EAPR. So for example, when you have to recreate something or explain something with travel history, these sample documents help you to, to understand how best to structure it so that an officer understands it the first time. And so great insight, Chanel. This was wonderful. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. And you guys will see a lot more of Chanel in the coming days and weeks. So thank you, Chanel. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to working with everyone. Wonderful. All right, take care. We'll say goodbye to Chanel. And let's jump over and start getting to some questions. All right, so that was great. It was awesome to have Chanel join us. And just to give, uh, give a shout out to her and help you guys uh, get to know her a little bit, just like you have gotten to know myself and, and Alicia and Susan and Igor. So now is the time where you can start posting your questions. Uh, make sure that you always put a cue in front of it. And if you've posted a question before and I haven't answered it yet, well, understand, I need you to post it again, okay? So that's kind of how we structure this because it's too hard for me to go back and get to them. All right, so let's dive in here and let's see who we've got first. Okay, and remember, try to keep them concise, not too big. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. Um, uh, Vishvesh says... Um, I've come to India for my wedding, received AOR. IRCC website is under maintenance since many days, and they keep sending me an email to link my application, but I'm not able to. What to do? Vishvesh, this is a classic example. I recommend that you book a consult with us, and we can, we can try to sort this out. This is something that we are seeing 
It's just rampant. It's all over the place. I am liaising directly with the minister staff, the minister of immigration. Um, we are working directly. We have uh, a specific coordinator within the Canadian Bar Association that is focused exclusively on this issue. Her whole role is to deal with the portal problems and reporting them to our IRCC liaison representative. And so this is something, Vishvesh, that that thousands of people are experiencing as immigration is trying to figure out how to move this massive database to a new portal so that it can function properly. But like we've talked about before, it's like having um, a, a computer with a hard drive that is 99% full. And every time you try to add something new, it crashes. And so in the process of trying to migrate it over to a new, uh, basically a new um, a hard drive, a new system, uh, there's been all kinds of technical glitches and problems. And you know what? Half of the time, Vishvesh, they don't even see this. They don't even know what's happening. And so the only thing that you can do is to send web forms to the IRCC web form and indicate that this, you know, you're trying to respond, but you can't. And um, that's the only thing that you can do because there's, you know, do your best to report where you can to the, the, sometimes you can report a technical problem to report that and just constantly following up, following up. But it's a nightmare. And I, I feel for you, my friend, it is an absolute nightmare. Okay, George says, my GSIPS notes say final approved and on page two and COPER created on September 27th, status not started and user remark, can't land, um, very required. What does that mean? Everything is passed and final approved. So basically it means that they're just stalled out, George. And um, this, this final, when it's talking about um, can't land uh, verification required, they basically are in the process of sorting out what they're going to do with all these people that have been in the queue for a long time, George. I would follow up with them via web form, indicate that you you know your application is ready. If they need anything, let me know. That's the only thing that you can do at this stage. And obviously watch your email, watch for any notifications. And then um, if you see anything, like any kind of a um, uh, an update that's not appearing on your, your profile, anything that looks unusual, then um, you're going to follow it up immediately with another web form. And this is a disaster and there's no way that I can, you know, I can't give anyone, George, uh, a step-by-step, -step, you know, um, path forward to fix this because us as lawyers are experiencing it within our representative portals and all of these, these phantom requests that are duplicate, you know, that are being sent out just like, um, just like what uh, Vishvesh had indicated. It's just a nightmare. So all that you can do is continue to follow up via web form, tell them that, look, I can see it's approved. Is there anything you need from me? And just keep keep hammering them with with uh, with status updates. And and if they say, oh, we don't look at these, well, who cares? Just keep sending them because at this stage, the communication has just become a complete disaster. I don't know how else to describe it. Okay. All right. Let's just jump to a couple of the uh, super chats. I want to make sure I'm not missing any of those. Let's see here as we zip through. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in and giving Chanel such a warm welcome. She's just going to be, she's just a wonderful addition to the firm. Um, I absolutely, yeah, I'm just so, so happy to have her with us. Okay, Juliana says, um, came to the U.S. from Europe as a tourist and overstayed my visa. Is it possible for me to immigrate to Canada and use my work reference from the U.S.? Well, here's the thing. So um, when, uh, if you go back to the YouTube channel, and I'm just going to flip over here and let's see if I can, if it just shows me. Yeah. So if you go back to our YouTube channel here and you search, <laughs> let's see, I think I can search for Igor. Let's see if I can pull him up. Um, right here, special guest with an amazing story. I think you guys can see this now. Let me just see here. Yeah, you can. So if you go here and you click on this special guest with an amazing story, you will hear about Igor's experience. And um, Igor actually uh, was in that situation where he fell out of status. Now, the only difference, Juliana, is the fact that for, for Igor, he had prior work experience before he came to Canada. So whether or not you can count that work experience, nothing in the regulations prohibits someone from counting foreign work experience if the person was out of status. So there's no regulation that I'm, uh, I'm familiar with. There's no program delivery instruction. 
that says if you are out of status in another country that you can't count that work experience. The challenge is getting that employer to being willing to uh, to be willing to um, actually uh, provide a letter and say, yeah, I employed Juliana without status, right? And to show that you've actually been paid because often then they pay under the table. So, you know, it may be that you had a, a social security number and you, you know, you have your pay slips and you have all those things. Um, then, you know, at, at that stage you go forward. But what an officer can do is they can question whether or not they believe that that work actually happened. And unless you have all of the documentation to prove it, well, that can be one of the challenges, okay? But that's a good, good question, Julianne. If you need any assistance, don't, rem- like, don't, I want you guys to always remember that, that yes, I'm here to answer your questions and everything. Oh, I've got the wrong one here. But, um, but this here, if you run into problems like that, Juliana, where it's really significant things, it isn't just simple question that I can answer here that benefits everybody else, but it's something that's really, really goes to the heart of your ability to, to immigrate, um, then book a consult. Get over here, um, book a consult with a member of our team, and we can help you and give you the advice you need to actually decide keep switching to the wrong one here to decide exactly how best to proceed. Okay. All right. So we'll flip down here again and then we'll just hit a couple more. Okay. So here's another question. And um, random girl said she applied tier to peer international graduate stream for proof of education, uploaded a study permit, but not my transcript. Should I send a web form? Will I get rejected? there is a significant chance that you're going to run into a problem. Absolutely, without reservation, you want to update because your application is incomplete. The study permit isn't enough. You need to actually have proof that you've, um, if you, and you, you went through the international graduate stream, so you absolutely need to make sure that, that you provide them exactly with what they're asking for, which in many cases, I provide both the transcript as well as the, the diploma or degree confirming that you graduated. Now, in that time when people were submitting the applications, the pandemic was still raging. It still is in effect in many parts of Canada, most parts actually. Um, um, And people weren't able to get their confirmations of graduation before the deadline, that May deadline. And so they have shown a little bit of mercy, um, but you're absolutely going to want to update. You're going to want to go um, and do everything you can. Now, we know with the TR to PR pathway that the IRCC web form isn't designed for you to receive uploads of information. But I'll tell you, I don't care. I would still try to do it regardless. And then the moment they come back and hopefully, you know, hopefully they give you an opportunity to respond, um, then in that case, you're going to upload everything once again, that proof of, of graduation. So real serious. Um, it's a real serious issue for sure it is. Okay. Home support application, IRCC not responding after 90 days. How long they give me AOR? Oh my goodness. It is the, that program um, is, is, you know, taking months and months and months and months. And, you know, when you go and you try to find processing times, you know, sometimes we hear people of saying up to, up to a year. And as a, the Canadian Bar Association, and I think many of you know now that I'm the immediate past chair, I was the chair last year well this all throughout this year up until september and then now i'm serving my last year as a table officer um and kyle heineman my good friend in in uh, in vancouver um he is the chair right now but we are constantly dealing with issues like this processing times they've decided what are priorities and in the last correspondence we see from them number one was the afghan refugees number two was family reunification and number three was the processing of um, of all of the aged applications, all of the old applications, okay? All right, we'll hit one more super chat and then we'll jump back in. Um, okay, Harini says, applied for tier to peer from Quebec. Yeah. When getting portal link, is it mandate to give proof of living outside Quebec? Your thoughts on this? You will remember that I did once again, the source of all goodness, you guys, is to go back here And I'm going to go here and I'm going to go to, um, let's see, maybe I can search uh, TR to PR. I have so many videos on this topic. But let's see, may expand, breaking news, success, critical update, straight from IRCC. Um, I'm just looking here to see which one. Uh, Certificates, I think it might have been 
the policy manual. I'm trying to remember new update. Okay, I think it's this one here. So this this video right here is uh, this one new program instructions straight from IRCC. I think this is the one where they shared um, uh, basically the program delivery instructions. Oh, I keep pushing the wrong one here. The program delivery instructions uh, where they talk about how to deal with people who need to prove an intention to reside outside of Quebec. And so usually if they have an issue with this, they're instructed to send a procedural fairness letter. But I can tell you that there's a vast amount of discretion given to those officers to decide whether or not you've met that requirement. Obviously, anyone who's not physically living in Quebec, even though they're counting their work experience and things from Quebec or their international graduate, um, uh, their, their education from Quebec, that's fine. But you have to show an intention to live outside. And so what constitutes intention can be very, very well varied is the best way to describe it. So in your situation, it's not a specific requirement that you have to have been outside of Quebec at the time you submit your application. But I can tell you that when they're making the decision, um, I never, ever want my clients to still be in Quebec. I want them to be out because then there's no, ex, you know, there's no just, how do you describe it? There's, 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 there's very little that an officer can say uh, to question that intention if you are physically living outside Quebec. If you're not, then that's where, once again, I push you back over here to book a consultation and we can talk about the options that might be available for you. Okay. And I, I won't hesitate to, to tell you guys how important it is to book those, those consultations. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Um, wow. There's so many questions that were being posted. You guys, let me just see here if I can find where I'm at. Okay. Um, and then George, a big shout out to you. He says, uh, yes, <laughs> I know you're the last one. He said, all the people who took the course with you have got their PR in three months, except for him. And I understand. Yeah, you're, you're just in limbo there, George, but you're so close. You're there. You're there. Okay. So let's see what we can do here. I'm just going to try to uh, see if I can find uh, where we left off with the previous questions. And trust me, you guys, we will, I will miss your question. Um, I'm doing the best I can to try to get to everybody that's been posting, but for sure, I will miss your question. So understand that will happen and I'm not going to be able to always uh, get to everybody who's, who's been posting questions. Okay. All right. So let me just flip down a little bit. That's hilarious. Alexa, she says you two are like Barbie and Ken. I'm assuming that that is Chanel. <laughs> well, I'm no Ken, uh, maybe Chanel. I don't know. I think that's a compliment. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> Okay, let's see what else we've got here. We'll get to a few more questions. Uh, okay, so there's George. Okay, so I think this one here. Um, okay, we'll try to get to this one. Okay. Oh my goodness, that's my story, traveling and eating. <laughs> okay, from Pakistan. Spousal sponsorship, August 2019. Received pre-arrival, yes. Uh, on July 2021. Um, August 2021, yes. And waiting for PPR since then, no response. Yes, I completely, completely understand what you're going through. The reality is right now, it's the overseas visa offices. And what we're seeing is that they're just not full to the complement they were with officers um, as, it, as, as it was in existence before the pandemic hit. So when they're operating with fewer officers, it's taking them a lot longer to physically get your passport, imprint the visa in it, so that you can travel. And so all I can tell you at this stage is to hang in there, continue to watch your email. It's going to take them a while to work through the backlog. But number two, family reunification is number two on the list. And if it wasn't for the whole Afghan crisis, you guys would be number one on the list and then Express Entry would be number two. So hang in there. I know it's easy for me to say that. My heart goes out to you. But, um, but at this stage, it's just a waiting game. Okay. All right, <clears throat> Lou says, <clears throat> okay, let's see. I applied for tier to peer on May 10th. In that moment, I didn't have a previous refusal. In October, I was refused for an open work permit. Do I need to update that refusal to my PR to PR app? Tier to PR? No, you don't. Um, immigration can see it. You answered all questions truthfully at the time in which you submitted it. I guess, you know, let me backtrack a little bit on that, Luz. Um, you, you're, you know, they could very well come back and ask questions of you, and it wouldn't hurt to update 
it wouldn't hurt to, if you have your acknowledgement of receipt. It wouldn't hurt for you to to just send an update to just say, hey, my open work permit was refused. I'm just updating my statutory information section on the Schedule A. And, um, you know, but but for all intents and purposes, you're never going to be found to have misrepresented anything on your application if you have anything happening after you filed it. You have an obligation to to update and to, um, if there's been any changes, but they're not going to find misrepresentation if for something that happened after your application was submitted especially with how impossible in the TR to PR pathway they make it to update a file. All right. Uh, Jello, good to see you. Okay. Tenzim says, FSW Outland, AOR September 2020, GMS eligibility. Pass, security not started. Yep. In progress. Info share completed. When can I expect final results? Positive. Tenzim, you're in, you're in the queue. It's, it's, you're moving forward. And September 2020, you know, you think of that, it's over a year now, right? But there are people that were December or earlier 2019, depending upon where you're at, as an outlander, it's all visa offices. So as far as I'm concerned, um, things are moving forward in the way they, the way they're supposed to, given the huge massive backlogs. All right. Um, Suvia says, hey, again, Mark, I'm not the primary applicant on tr to pr Can I travel outside of Canada? Well, even if you are the primary applicant, you know, there's no law preventing you from traveling. I just tell people that I don't want to take the chance. But there's no, like, there's no restriction as long as you can get back in. But you have to understand that if anything happens overseas for whatever reason, you're still a temporary resident to Canada. And if an officer feels that you don't meet the requirements of whatever temporary status you have, they can refuse you entry. Um, but it doesn't invalidate the TR to PR pathway because it's the primary principal applicant that is the one that's the most important. Okay, let's try to shift this around a little bit. Um, okay, here's another one. Akshdeep says, I traveled outside of Canada for about 21 days to Europe after submitting my CEC. Do I need to inform IRCC about my new travel history? I typically don't do that, um, Akash. But I can tell you that there's no harm in, up, in, in updating with, with respect to travel. So if you wanted to send a web form, you can totally do it. It's not going to harm. It's not going to hinder. Um, but usually with with travel after I filed the application, unless you physically moved residences, change of address, I don't usually worry about short little holidays that you take. All right. Um, okay, I'll answer this one. Feed Yoga says CEC be canceled and no more CEC draws at all. No, the program will always exist. It is just a matter of them figuring out what it's going to look like in the future. If the changing in the you know, the knock process, which is not going to happen till a year out from now. That's why I'm not talking about it. Um, but no, I don't see any world at this stage where the CEC is going to be canceled. And um, yeah, I really don't see any any reason. It's a very effective program and immigration really, really likes it. So I can't see any, any chance that it's going to be canceled. Um, there will be, you know, will there be future draws that are just CEC draws? Well, we'll have to see how the how it plays out. For a long time, it was um, it was no program specified draws, uh, but if you if you factor in you know how things are playing out, um, it's hard to say. I think that there still will be CEC draws. That's myself. Okay. Um, okay. So OC says if there's no express entry this year, will temporary residents and international students be considered? Well. It's possible they could open up a new version of the TR to PR pathway. That's possible. But I think if they were going to do that, they the same reasons why we haven't seen them open up the TR to PR pathway are the same reasons that they haven't been issuing ITAs. It's they've got this massive backlog that they're trying to work through. And with the, the, um, with the Afghan crisis and all of the applications they're trying to process there for people that are in life and death situations, um, they're just not adding more people to the queue other than the provincial nominee programs. And so um, I think in, in next, I think for sure in the new year, that's when we're going to expect to see more draws coming through. Um, but at this stage, that's why. So I don't, I don't see them, you know, opening up any new programs. They don't have to, the programs are there. It's just a matter of knowing they've got capacity to start taking in more applications. Okay. Um, and I've got a lot of people asking processing times and things like that. Those are all over the map. And especially when it comes to the provinces, 
some provinces like the New Brunswick PNP or the Alberta one, um, sometimes they will post the processing times. So go to the website and take a look, but I don't know offhand how long, I just don't have um, a lot of applications submitted through that program. So I can't answer that. Okay, uh, Jovi says, can a traveler with a spousal open work permit now come to Canada even without a job offer but don't qualify as fully vaccinated? Um, the, the real issue is travel restrictions, right? And so the ability to board the plane, you need to have the vaccines that the government of Canada has indicated if you want to avoid quarantine. Um, in your case, Jovi, there's a lot of different factors that come into play. Um, you know, every bit as much as um, what has happened in the past, officers are still sorting through what's required and what isn't required. And I recommend, Jovi, that you book a consult with us. In particular, book a consult with Alicia. She's the travel restriction expert in, um, yeah, in, in, our, uh, uh, in our firm. And so I highly recommend that you shift over here and that you go down and you book a consultation with Alicia because she is the one that can give you, um, uh, give you really good advice and direction on that. All right. Whew, you guys, I think we've hit the end of the line today. Um, I'm just going to pull up uh, my calendar here and just see what I have going on. And today, oh, you guys, let's see, you're in luck. So we've got a little bit more time. So I've got a little bit, I can go a little bit over time. So that's what I'm going to do. So let's just flip back here. And um, I'm looking at your last name, Jovi, and it is, it's it's hilarious. I say it's hilarious because my hometown was Carmangay and you've got Kam Kamangay, which is very, very close to my hometown. And um, I can't help but uh, but show you guys this. So let's flip over to the web and I'm going to search up Carmangay, Alberta. Whoops, that'll there we'll find it. So there's Wikipedia here, Carmangay Village. So this is my hometown. This is where I grew up. The population is really, really small. So I, I'm trying to remember what the population is. I know it's got it listed somewhere. Um, uh, population, 242 people down here. So that's where I grew up. That was a small town. I lived in a farm outside of Carmangay. And um, I'll show you something here that uh, gives me great pride. I wonder if it's on here. Um, Let's see, featured gallery. Let's see if there's anything in the gallery here. Uh, we've got stuff from the parades that they used to do. I don't see it. The entrance to Carmen Gay has a wagon, and that wagon was my father's wagon. And let's see if I can see it right here if they have it. Uh, it's not there. I think these images on here are a little bit old. And... Um, Let's see here. Oh, there we go. You can barely see it right there. So there's a wagon you guys can see. I think you guys can see it. Yeah, it's really tiny. There's this old wagon right here by the, the sign to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the front of Carmagee. And that wagon right there was my father's wagon. And so uh, we donated it to the town. So there we go. A little bit of a tangent. But hey, that's all right. We can have some fun, can't we? So there you go, <laughs> Jovi. Your, your last name is very close to the... The, the village that I grew up in, um, that is what I call my hometown, and uh, very cool. Okay, this one, I'm not sure if I can answer this. Okay, I've encountered fraudulent activity in my bank account where a large amount was stolen, so I decided to move the rest of the money to a new bank. That's horrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. Would the IRCC think that as a red flag considering the bulk deposit? You are going to explain in a letter of explanation. Provide all the evidence that you can to show that there was a fraudulent theft out of your account and use the letter of explanation to address it. Remember, the whole reason that I created the course right here was to help people understand how to write letters of explanation, how to protect themselves. And I use these letters of explanation like a shield, like like a shield to protect me in the, in the event that a circumstance is such that it's just not easy to explain or there isn't any opportunity to explain something that just looks different or unusual in the application. And so I strongly, strongly want to encourage you guys to go over, click on the link below to the Canadian Immigration Institute, and it will take you right here. You can see the courses. We have other ones. I've got a spousal. I'm just about ready. The LMIA course is, is alive and well. I'm working on a PR, court, P, 
PR card course as well. But go here, click on this and join me. Although the class starts December the 6th, you can get access to all of the materials that I've been showing you um, right now. And you can start working through everything. Keep shipping, shifting to the wrong page here. Okay, let's keep zipping through. And I'm going to try to do my best to get to as many people as I can. Um, okay, Dan says, who might get the AOR first? Someone who applied around 30,000 in the IG stream versus applied in non-essential stream June 1st. Are they processing two streams separately or everything together? Any insight? Everything's together, Dan. I have never heard of them identifying or separating out certain streams and processing them quicker than others. It has always been a first in, first out. That has been that was what was instructed and told to us early on. And there's Mamo saying thanks to Chanel. So we'll give her a shout out, even though she's off doing some other stuff. And I know Chanel may be tuning in or popping in periodically as well. Um, yeah, so you might watch for the comments. And remember, in the Facebook group, and we'll flip back here again, you'll see here that this group, and, and we're here, there's Chanel right there, um, this Express Entry Law Group, Chanel's going to be uh, managing that and administering this group for me and just bringing more um, more practical, uh, you know, just, just being more active in here for us. Because one of the things that frustrated me the most was that Facebook never let anybody see, you know, you can see here, view insights, post reach right now, zero post reach. Like when I put any links outside or post into the group from anywhere else outside of Facebook, they just shut it down and they don't let anybody hardly see it. And it's a miracle that, you know, that, that like Quan and really that anybody has hardly even been able to see it. But this is, yeah, that's the frustrating part. Even when I, in my own group, when I post my own videos and there's over, you can see how many people here, I think you can see over 126,000 people in the group. How is that even possible that only three or four are actually seeing it? So because of that, I just, it really irritates me. And so we're going to see what we can do to try to get that moving forward. Okay. And I'm also trying, if I've answered someone's question, I'm trying to get to another one as well uh, from, from other people that have been patiently waiting. And I appreciate you guys waiting, doing the best I can to get through the questions. Um, okay. Here's a tough one, Tatiana. I, uh, this is one that I'm going to suggest. I'm going to ring that little bell right there that says book a consult. Uh, because the biggest issue that I have right now is um, is just sorting out the specifics. So when someone asks a specific question, um, so studied remotely last year while filling the EE application, should I write the city that appears on the certificate or the city I actually studied? Actually, I can probably answer this one. Do I need to submit an LOE about it? Okay, so if you are studying um, like in, in like actually out of your home, so it's by correspondence, that's what you type in there. You put, the, you put the location where you are physically present. That's the city where you're physically present. And then by the name of the institution, you write by correspondence if you're studying remotely. And that comes straight from the express entry, um, uh, my, my, favorite, my favorite page of all, which is this one right here, which is the applications for permanent residence subject to the express entry completeness check. That one uh, has all the good answers and information and instructions in here. And I'm just going to search by correspond. Oh, wrong one. I'm in the wrong field here, right here. I'm going to search by correspondence. And there it is. I already found it. So right here, you'll see this is, this is instructions that officers are given uh, when you're proving studies. And it says right down here, as you scroll down, it says applicants are instructed to indicate that their education was completed by correspondence by typing in brackets by correspondence on the same line as the education institution name, okay? So that is, that's the instructions. That's what I follow um, for those types of um, situations, which I think kind of is, 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 is yours, I think. Okay, let's see what we have next. Um, let's see, we'll hit a couple more uh, super chats that popped in here. I don't want to miss any of those. Okay, Alberth has got one here, and I'm not sure. Sometimes people just just uh, provide a donation, which I really appreciate that helps. But I'm going to see if I can figure out where his question is. Um, okay, let's see if we can get to Alberth. So this one says, does anyone know if having an LMIA can help you to get an open work permit? 
I'm under postgrad work permit visa. This will expire mid of next year. I'm aware that postgrad cannot be extended. I already submitted my EE pro, um, profile. So yeah, the, the, the reality is the LMIA and getting, it's really a new work permit. And that is, if you're running out of time, you don't have an, um, uh, an acknowledgement of receipt from any PR economic program, eligible under the Bridging Open Work Permit Program, then you, you need to get an LMIA from that employer and then you use that LMIA to apply for um, for another work permit. Um, I think we've answered that. Uh, will th uh, This will expire mid of next year. If I get an LM LMIA, will I be able to apply for an open work permit? I'm aware that post-grad can't be extended. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. You can totally transition from a post-grad to an LMIA-based work permit if the employer has actually gone through the process of, of getting it, okay? So good, that's a good, good question. All right, let's see what else we have here. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Let's just search here. Okay, who is next? Um, I wanna make sure I'm not missing anyone here. And I definitely was missing a few people. Okay, um, let's see who's next. Um, Okay, Fayez um, says, <clears throat> what if I made a mistake in my work permit and it was approved and now I fixed all the errors while submitting the PR? Is this still misrepresentation? Well, this is how you correct it. <clears throat> I always go back, <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of the, the new PR, you correct it, but then you also notify them that you made a mistake in a previous work permit. And, <clears throat> and I do a lot of this with clients, helping them. And I'll, I'll ring the bell and tell you to go book a consult, um, Fayez. Because what happens is it's, you have to do it correct. Uh, you have to do it correctly. But when it's done correct, it works. And you advise immigration. You make the, sure that the errors are corrected in your PR. And then if you if you fail to disclose something or you made a mistake in a prior work permit application, then you disclose that and you correct the record. I always always do that. And anyone who tells you don't worry about it, it's already been submitted. Don't say anything. Well, that's not the advice that I give my clients. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we've got here, uh, Saeed, I think I answered your question, my friend, but let's just see here. I'm slowly learning to be able to search a little bit here. So, um, I think maybe this is the question. We'll hit this one. So my common law partner and I made a mistake during our application and chose non-accompanying. Now my partner received her PR card as main applicant, but not me. Well, then that your, your partner needs to sponsor you as a spouse. Um, I hope, now obviously if you listed non-accompanying, well, that's why they didn't ask you to um, you know, provide any of the same information that the principal applicant did. That's why the principal applicant was able to get CRS points if it was through express entry um, based on her human capital or his human capital points alone. In your case, you would need to be sponsored as a spouse. That, that, would, be the, um, that would be the process. Okay, let's see who we have next here. Make sure I'm not missing anyone else. Sometimes it's a little bit tricky uh, screening through here. Okay. Gurpreet, and you guys make sure when you're doing the super chats that you actually put, <laughs> put your question, re rephrase it right in here. Okay. Because otherwise it's really hard for me to, to find the questions that you had originally asked. So, okay, let's see here. Um, okay. So it looks like Gurpreet, your questions relate. Uh, this is hard because I've got two Gurpreets that are like identical. Okay. Um, Kate, so we've got a hay mark there. We've got, I live in Aust Australia. My AOR is February 2020, FSW Outland. I want to move to India. Does it affect my application processing time or should I wait? Ultimately, any kind of shift that you make can affect processing time. If they start down the process of finalizing you through Sydney and then you then have to go to, you know, go through Delhi or, or Chandigarh or wherever they're processing. Um, India right now is not great. So the you know that anyone who shifts over there, it's going to take longer uh, than probably than, than going through the Sydney office in Australia. Um, and so just purely based on the visa office itself, I think that could result in a little bit longer processing if you were to go through India and then have to finalize there. 
Um, but as far as whether you should stay or whether you should go, I have to ring the bell and tell you to book a consult, your preet, so that we can go through all of the issues and, and look at everything um, holistically. I always struggle with people asking specific, should I do this question? Because I need a whole lot more information. Okay, I think we've got that one there for you, Gapreet. Okay, let's jump back here now and get back to the other ones. I'm just trying to hit all the super chats here before we wrap up. Um, okay, let's see here. Gapreet. Okay, we've got Albert here. So uh, let's see if we can find Albert's question. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, it's searching here. Now it's kind of frozen a little bit. I hope I didn't end this. Okay, we're still good. It was just freezing up a little bit on me there. Um, okay, Albert says, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's kind. Maybe it was just a thank you. And that's really kind. I don't see any, um, I don't see any, anything else. Let's see here. Got to make sure I'm not missing any questions. Okay. Okay, so we've got that one completed. Yes, I did get that one. Okay, let's see what is next here. Um, who's next on the list? As we're just shifting through here. Okay. Okay, the Bass Ninja. Let's pull up the Bass Ninja. So what does GCMS delay of more than three months mean? Well, uh, meds passed March 2021, did not get reply for first G CMS notes, August Outlander CC. So understand that because of the massive volume of people that are submitting requests for GCMS, it's just taking them a long time to deal with it. And um, when they've closed off all other avenues of processing, or I should say all other avenues of communication, well, that's the default. You uh, Everybody then submits GCMS and it is not surprising to hear that it's taking three months to get it back. I am really, really frustrated with IRCC. And this is where I'm going to be very critical of them because they're, they're, the way they've communicated with people is just simply not acceptable. It's just, it's not in any way, shape or form. Um, very disappointing. Okay. Uh, Nuren says, uh, passport expiring in seven months after AOR. Do I wait for passport request and then renew or renew it now and inform CIC through the form? Absolutely renew it now and then send the update through the IRCC web form. That's what you do. You don't need to wait at all. If you have a new passport, uh, Neuron, then absolutely, um, or if it's expiring, then go get your new passport and then update. Don't wait. Okay. Uh, Kurt Moses, actor, <laughs> says, um, IRCC refused my open work permit while I'm waiting for my tier to PR because I didn't upload my language test. Well, I'd be able to reapply once I get my AOR. So the biggest issue with the acknowledgement of receipt, your open work permit, I'm assuming through the TR to PR pathway, um, is your um, is is your acknowledgement of receipt. Um, I'm just looking here to see if you received it. it says that you're waiting for your PR because I didn't upload my language test. Um, there's a little bit more going on here, Kurt, than I can probably sort out. Um, you have the ability to restore at times if work permits have expired. You have the ability to restore for 90 days in some cases. When it comes to the policy on the TR to PR uh, bridging open work permit, I know that to a large extent there are similarities between that one and the regular bridging open work permit. But um, Kurt, I'm going to ring the bell and ask you to book a consult so that we can take a look at that in more detail because there's, there's a lot more information that I need uh, in order to give you advice because it may be that you're just not going to have enough time or that too much time has passed. It depends upon what the refusal letter instructed you, if they said that you can restore um, or, or what the specific instructions were. And even when you indicate here that your language test because you didn't upload it, well, if, if you didn't upload a language test, then your entire TR to PR application is going to get refused. It's not just the bridge, it's your whole application because that was a critical component to it. And if that was the case, then there is no way to extend because you're, you, this is one of the, the fatal problems, Kurt. You, you not only do you have um, an application, uh, a PR application that has been refused, but, but there's no getting back. The program is, is closed. And, uh, and so there's a lot of factors here that are kind of all these warning signs are, 
are being triggered. And I recommend that you book a consult for us to see if they can be saved, Kurt. But you're in a tough situation. Okay, um, let's see who's next here. Rohith says, I'm in India and have a valid postgrad work permit, but my TRV to return to Canada is not processing. Received notification of interest from Ontario. What should I answer to for the question, do you have a valid status in Canada? Well, you have, you, you, you're in India and have a valid postgrad work permit. So, but your TRV to return to Canada is still in process. Well, when it comes to valid status in Canada, you're going to indicate that you do have a postgrad work permit, but you're currently outside. And so you can say, yes, you have valid status, which is your postgrad. It's just you need the entry visa to be able to get on the plane and come. So, um, so that postgrad does, that work permit does give you status in Canada, um, but you just need to be able to get on the plane to come, right? So I would answer that yes. And like every other time, Rohit, I would then provide a letter of explanation explaining exactly why you answered the question the way you did. Okay, uh, Nitin says, international Indian national already in Canada, got a proof for study visa. Can I flag pull to get my study permit? Flag polling for study permits. Um, I'm going to ring the bell right here. Um, the only people, and the reason I say this is because I'm going to need a whole lot more information from you um, in order to be able to, to explain and answer this question. But for general information purposes, the only individuals that were able to apply in the past um, for study permits at the ports of entry were citizens of the United States. Everybody else had to go through the visa office. So you applied overseas through your visa office. You obtained your approval, which I'm assuming is the case. And in those situations, flag polling is the same as getting on a plane and flying to Canada. So, um, so it, you know, on the surface, it looks like that may be a possibility, but I never want to give you direct advice like this, Nitin. This is really legal advice. And I recommend that you book a consult so that we can talk about that and just make sure that everything actually is in place. The last thing in the world I want you to do is to go down to the border, do a flagpole, and then have a border officer take exception or have some issue with whatever, you know, your status was or something you could have done, ask questions. I've seen so many so many problems arise because of that. Um, okay. Okay. So Albert says, can I have CAC points for an incomplete program I made at my home country? This has only done half of the program one year instead of two. If you haven't completed the program, then you're not going to get education points for it. You need to have had it completed. And if it's from outside of Canada, um, you have to have an educational credential assessment. If you don't have it, then it won't work. This is quite funny. Um, actually not um, <laughs> PSJ. That's funny. Uh, I'm not going to answer that question just because <laughs> PSJ was trying to be funny. <laughs> okay, not cool. I paid 10 for ST. It was missed. Please pull up Q. I think I already did that, Harshil. Let's see what you got, my friend. Okay. Um, I think I already answered it. I applied my, uh, my SOWP on November 20th as per GCMS notes. Yeah, officer, last touched my file, June 2021, eligibility passed. How long does it take to approve? Okay, I think I got this one, Harshil. Um, I'm not sure. I think you're the one in the same here. You guys have, you've got a no image here, and then you got an image there. I think I've covered that answer to that one. When it comes to the processing of a spousal open work permit, um, this all depends upon the country that you're coming from, right? And so even though the GCMS notes, like it's just stalled out, and the reality is, is, as with many of these overseas visa offices, like I said, priority number one is the, the Afghan crisis. Two is family reunification. Technically, a spousal open work permit is in that category, um, uh, but it's not treated the same as a sponsorship. And then three is all the pending applications, which primarily permanent residents and then temporary residents. So I can't tell you, Harshil, for instance, uh, you know, for, with any degree of, of specificity there. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can get, okay. All right. Let's see. Now we have, <laughs> okay. So now we've got PSJ. So let's, let's pull up PSJ again here and see if we can get this one and we'll finish off here. Okay. Um, okay. It says, I, do I need a T4 pay, pay stubs is enough for super visa? I always include everything. So pay stubs are what they traditionally ask for. And when you're in Canada and you've got a, you know, a super visa, which I'm assuming is for a parent that's coming to visit, 
In those situations, um, I will often include whatever I have. So pay stubs are usually enough, but if you have T4s, then, then I include them. Okay, well, I will address this one. Apply for parent super visa, PR in Canada. Do I need T4 to apply pay stubs? Job offer letters enough? My one year work experience completes in January, 2022. So yeah, so there's the answer, PSJ. So that's, ex that's exactly what I, um, uh, if you've got them, I include them. All right, that's, that's what I do. I never hold back. All right, let's see what else we have here. I think we've got, um, I think we've got everything uh, addressed. I don't think I'm missing anyone. I don't believe. Uh, okay, here we go. Let's let's get to a few more last ones um, from people that are that are asking questions. And I know that they're not like I said repeatedly. I'm not going to be able to get to everybody's questions. So bear with me. Hopefully, the question you have is similar to the ones that I've already answered. Um, and let's just jump in and uh, and see what we have here. Um, yeah, and lots of people are asking the same questions. When will the skilled vi uh, skilled visa worker visa start? When will CEC draws happen? We've talked about that. FSW draw, will it happen soon? FSW, all of you guys are asking that. I personally don't think we're going to see any movement until the new year. That's what I feel. 2022, before we see, start to see more ITAs issued for outlanders. And when it comes to CEC draws, I think right now there's there's a you know there might be a better chance that there could be a CEC um, possibly in December. But with the way backlogs are in the in the Afghan crisis, I'm not holding my breath until the beginning of next year. Um, Singh says, "Can I add my spouse after getting an Alberta notification of interest?" Well, I always reach out to Alberta and uh, notify them of what I want to do, and uh, ultimately IRCC. If you can make any changes you want to your profile and the notification of interest is not based on your spouse, it's based on you, your, your CRS score, the occupation that you're in, if it's in an area that Alberta feels is in demand, those are the factors. Uh, in most provinces, they don't care. But sing, I'll ring the bell and encourage you to book a consult as well. Um, but yeah, I, I would reach out to Alberta. I would proceed forward with your NOI, including your spouse and uh, just indicate to them. And then I would update your profile with the spouse. That's what I would do. Um, the only factor that sometimes comes into placing is if by adding your spouse, you would drop your CRS score below 300. And at this stage, we're not quite sure how Alberta is treating that. Um, Ontario doesn't seem to care, at least from the individuals that, 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 I've, uh, that I've spoke to. Okay, and then Mariana is asking a question that I've held off on. So they talked about how will the new knock codes affect future? Will knock codes moved around? Will some be no longer eligible? All of that, Mariana, is all speculation at this stage. So ultimately, when they're going to roll it out, they say at the end of next year, that's what they say, the end of 2022, I've never, ever seen ever them actually hit a target that they're shooting for, except for the launch of Express Entry when they said it was going to launch on January the 1st, 2015. They actually did launch it. Okay, Muhammad says, any misrep solution for work permit, please advise right here. Book the consult um, and, uh, and let's talk about how the best options are to, to address that, okay? Um, let's see what else we have here. Okay, Lisa says, I have, an, I have an express entry profile and it will expire on March. So now I'm applying for a study permit. Will my study visa outcome will get affected by the profile? Yes, there is an impact on your study permit application. But an officer, as I've said lots of times in the past, does not have the ability to just use the fact that you've got an express entry profile as a reason for refusal. It's a factor to show that you have an interest in coming to Canada um, but they usually will, will use it as a factor of many in making the decision. Okay, let's see here. Um, yeah, so Renita, thank you so much. And as far as predictions for the next ONP, wow. It's, you know, I know you're patiently waiting international students dream. We just don't know. The provinces do not advise in advance when they're going to do these rounds. They just make the decision to do it. And that's even, I look at Alberta where I'm very familiar with the, the officials running it. It's not like they reach out and let us know where things are at. Okay. Um, Alexa says, can you still use the PR photo submitted for TR to PR last May 6th? 
It's been more than six months. Why did they ask to submit it during the application? The photo itself, no. If you can't use it in the subsequent application, if it's older than six months, so it needs to be within that time frame. Why do they do it? Because they want to make sure that you're the person who's actually submitting the application. And by requesting a photo, they can match it up with your passport and ensure that it isn't some fake person who's filing the application. Okay. Um, Eric, I can't speak to this. I don't have a lot of experience with the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program. Um, I've got some good friends that have also appeared in my Immigration Nation in the past. And I'll just, I'll just go back here and I'll give them a shout out. So if, you, if I go here and I'll search uh, Manitoba, let's see what comes up. Let's see who we've got here. Breaking news, immigration, uh, Alicia. I'm pretty sure. Oh, there's Northwest Territories. Um, great news for students. <laughs> I've done a few videos, haven't I? I'm just trying to find, maybe I just need to search for Alistair. Alistair also appeared uh, before the standing committee with me. I'm going to do this here. Uh, Alistair. There we go. Right here. Search for Alistair. And we talked about, um, in that case, we talked about making Canadian immigration system better in the times of COVID. But Alistair is familiar with... Um, uh, what's going on in Manitoba. So after we, we did our presentation, uh, it was 11 months ago now, to the, uh, uh, to the Standing Committee on Immigration, Alistair and I, we, um, we did a special Immigration Nation. And you guys Hello, have to check those out. So I'll pause that. And then I'll scroll down here. And then if you go to the show more, you'll see Connect with Alistair. And Alistair's website is right here. And he's in Manitoba. And I recommend that you reach out to, uh, to Alistair and... Um, yeah. And, uh, and he can help you. Let's see. I'll show you Alistair. Talk about free promotion. Look at that free pr promotion. All right. Uh, there we go. Get back to the right screen here. There we go. Okay. We'll go through a couple more here and then we'll, um, and then we'll finish up. We went definitely into overtime, but I wanted to give you guys as much time as I possibly could. Um, Okay, let's see if there's anything else here that anyone else that I've... Um, okay, I think Gurpreet, we hit that one. We talked about the OINP. Uh, are they going to do another human capital priority draw this year? We just don't know. That's something that I can't, I can't answer for all the same reasons. Okay, and then... Um, okay, uh, hello here. <laughs> says, the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program nominated with employment offer already applied work permit outside Canada, but lost my passport in between. Just get a new passport and then advise IRCC. That's what you do. Um, make sure you've got a copy or confirmation that you've reported it stolen or lost. Um, and then just obtain a new one and then um, update IRCC with the new passport. And, uh, and you should be okay. All right. Let's see. I'll get a couple more questions here. I'll just pull them up. Um, okay. Mohammed, I think you, you indicate here, please advise for misrep case. I just, all I can tell you is to book a consult. That's exactly what, um, I'll turn that up a little bit and ring it again. Go over to our website right here uh, and book a consultation and we can go through um, the specifics of, of your situation. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, Emmanuel says, Mark, in express entry after biometric, my application can be denied. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Biometrics doesn't affect anything with respect to processing. So it's entirely possible you could complete the biometrics and then get your application rejected if you don't somehow uh, fit. Um, okay, Dan says, do you think at least 50% of the 97K applications, applicants under the tier to PR program will be processed by December 2021? Uh, <laughs> it's going to be tough. I know the minister, Minichino, our previous minister. Um, now he's public safety. Uh, he made some, some promises and there were some expectations, but I don't think anyone when those promises were given really fully appreciated the impact of the Afghan crisis. So I'm going to say no. That's my vote. Um, okay. Jess Preet says, how many tier to peer AOR left? Lots, as you could see, lots of people. Um, okay, let's see. We'll go to a couple more. Um, do, 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 do. Let's find one that works for everybody that I haven't gotten to. 
Okay, Nazar, uh, uh, Zarar says, or Nazir says, my visit visa application. Since March 2020 in process in Abu Dhabi, in, in Abu Dhabi I had applied uh, from Islamabad. Yeah, that's an insane amount of time processing. And I know that immigration has been trying to, to, uh, to sort out the backlog. In many instances, I recommend that you consider refiling it and letting them know that you'd previously submitted an old one. Okay. Um, okay, in RK, same thing. I'm going to ring a bell for you here because when it comes to am I eligible, really slide over, book a consultation with one of the lawyers, and we can help you to develop a strategy going forward. Okay? All right. I'm going to turn on the music, which is kind of the sign that we're going to wrap up. And uh, I'll just move out of the way here. You can see, woo, that road is the one that takes me right between those two mountain ranges there to this amazing fishing hole that there, where there are some beautiful, beautiful cutthroat trout. Unfortunately for me, the streams are closed now, the river's closed, and I don't have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to catch the fish you know, in the way that I wanted to. Um, but I'll show you. <laughs> Let's see if I can find one here. I'll show you what I'm pulling out of there. Okay, let's see if we can do this one here. I'm going to try to share this one with you guys. We'll finish off with the beautiful rainbow trout that I love. Let's see if I can find him here now. I think I can find it. Well, I had high hopes. <laughs> Looks like I can't pull it out. That's all right. I was going to show you a picture of a nice little rainbow trout that I have. And um, for whatever reason. Oh, let's see. Maybe I've got it now. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I'm going to sign off. I want to thank you guys for all tuning in today. And we'll sign off with this beautiful little cutthroat trout that I caught back in the mountains behind me. Thanks so much for joining. I absolutely love everybody, your patience, your willingness to kind of wait your turn. And those that we weren't able to get to, um, my apologies for that. We try to do the best we can to answer as many questions. And well, today we went an hour and 37 minutes. So this is my way of trying to give back. All right, guys, thank you so much. Let's see if we can get it on here. Take care.